you know, this session is uh, more focused on trying to understand the challenges that we as an industry are facing, uh, both in terms of physics as well as, uh, you know, the, the corporate sector expectation versus the public interest. Uh, so I, I want to begin with my first question, and it is, uh, Dr. Clare, I'd like to ask you because you're so passionate about it, that there was a time when doctors were treated next to God. And uh, unfortunately, there is a trust deficit which is there, and uh, you know, uh, what has led to this, and what are some of the unethical issues that is now becoming a burning issue in the industry today? It's a very controversial question, so. <laughs> Let me begin with this. First of all, I want to thank you, the Business World, <coughs> as well as the Heal uh, Foundation. We have taken the first such step to call uh, Padma doctors and to discuss what the health scenario of country. So, compliments to you. <coughs> That's number one. Number two, what you said is very right. We have seen uh, progressively decline in the trust of the public and doctors and hospitals. Let's face it, let's accept the reality. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> I have been in Delhi for the last 33, 34 years after my uh, you know, training in the UK and there has been a progressive decline. And I tell you there are reasons for that. The reasons are multiple. First of all, if there is any uh, inadequate treatment or wrong treatment of a patient from any doctor, it is because of two reasons. One reason is the doctor doesn't have adequate knowledge of the latest, what could be done. So this will be called as a <coughs> lack of knowledge or uh, that he is not up to the mark. And uh, we have such doctors, such medical professionals who do not keep uh, pace with the advancing knowledge. The second reason could be that he is knowledgeable, but he is not ethical. He does some procedure uh, which is not required, medically speaking, for the benefit, for the commercial. Uh, benefit. So, and I honestly speaking, there are both the components in our country. The problem is that if there are 10% or 15% less unethical people, the whole community is uh, labeled as unethical. <clears throat> so, that is one reason that there is a deficiency on our part. So, this I accept is on our part. The second thing is the uh, negative role uh, played by, and I'm sorry to say very openly, negative role played by our politicians for the benefit of publicity. It's very, for the last 15 years, it's very uh, kind of normal nature to blame hospital, to blame doctors, particularly private uh, sector. <clears throat> Though today, Almost 75% of the healthcare in India is delivered by private sector. So they are labeled as they, that they take more money, they do this thing and that thing. And many politicians have given statements in the paper. Uh, all of you must know. The second thing is, the third thing is, I think even the role of press has been negative. If there is a doctor, if some patient dies, they make prominent headlines all over the country. So, and so, on. so this is a mixture of all these things. So as far as I'm concerned, my role as a doctor is to rectify my own yard. That how as doctors, we can remove this deficit, we can get back to our uh, past glory is, first of all, I would recommend that there should be a system where doctors are supposed to attend certain CRE that they have to have credit hours in, let's say, every year, so many credit hours, he has to attend some meetings so that he knows 
what is there latest and <clears throat> this is not only by compulsory it must be it must be must be mandatory the second thing i i have recommended in the past i even do that today that there has to be some kind of minimum examination every five years of any doctor see once you get a degree it doesn't mean that you, you are good for life medicine is ever changing uh, subject you get a lot of publication daily. I, I don't know the, how many number of publications come daily. Even in cardiology, I'm not able to keep pace with them. So nobody is perfect. Every five years, some minimum examination could be uh, computer way sitting at home should be there. That's this is to augment the capability of the medical professional. Then as far as the unethical practice is concerned, only way is that we should introduce uh, what is called a medical auditing, which doesn't exist in our India. If I do, let's say, 30 angioplasties in a month, there should be somebody to check my one or two, three cases randomly and find out exactly whether I've done the right thing or not. For example, if I'm the auditor and I go to some center, I can pick up some, you know, random files, I will see the CD, I will see the history of the patient, I can tell you that whether this was required or not. So medical auditing should be introduced. I have said in the past, I say it again, and I think it will people like the new business world uh, to tell the government that we need some kind of medical audit. So if there is a doctor's or knowledge of enough, then they also have in this mind that there is somebody who is going to check you. Then I think this malpractice can be decreased to a lot of extent. Let me tell you that the people in America or Europe are not more honest. Human beings are the same everywhere. That's exactly, there's no difference. But in US and in those countries, there are checks. The checks by the government, the checks by the insurance company that this is what is supposed to be done. This is this was done wrongly. They'll catch you. So that kind of things are required uh, as per And I think it is a it is a it is a lot of loss to the public also because they have lost faith. I'll tell you one example. <coughs> 37 years man come to me to show you, to me, uh, you know, five years back. And he said, I said, what's the problem? He said, I get breathless. I, even when I lie down, I have to get up. So I see the file. Just one month before that, he gets a pain in his chest in the night. He goes to a hospital. He has an acute heart attack. The cardiologists say that you need urgent angioplasty, but he doesn't believe the doctor. He goes home. He goes home. Initially, I thought there must be some doctor who has not done the right treatment. I see the ECGs and ask him everything. The doctor said, what did you say? You said that you said that you said that you said that you said that. But we didn't have to trust him. So he didn't get him treated. If you don't open the artery in a acute heart attack, the damage to the heart will be permanent. So his ejection pressure dropped from 60 to 20 percent. Mind you, he was 37. Accompanied by his young wife and two small children. And I, I want to cry uh, what I saw. So this happened because of the lack of trust. So people, if you don't trust your doctor, many times you will be also in problem. I see it's both ways the problem. Dr. Uh, Clare, I think you, know, you brought up a very important issue. It's not just the trust which is being broken, but the impact of it is that people are not believing when they genuinely also have a you know, and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Rajinath, I would like to come to you on the same issue. When you're looking at the lack of faith in the system, lack of faith on the doctor, and when something negative happens, it is leading to violence against the doctor. What is leading to that apart from the two things that Dr. Claire has mentioned? Anything that you would like to add? You know, uh, today's occasion of calling in all the Padma Awardees, an excellent initiative and an idea, is again very inspiring by the great job done by these stellar persons and their institutes which they run. Along with that inspiration, unfortunately, over the years, private healthcare has really improved. And we are proud to have hospitals in India which are competing with the best in the world what we call five-star hospitals. Unfortunately, with that came 
the corporatization of healthcare. Nothing wrong with that. I'm a businessman too. It's okay to make money. It's good to make money. Money is to be used productively to grow and help in the economical growth of the country. All that is fine. What went wrong? Or as an outsider to the system, what do I see going wrong? I notice that the, tag, the tail is wagging the dog. The institutes were put up by doctors with very strong value systems. You see anybody's website, Vedanta, Portis, Max, Apollo, the doctors at the top and their statements are inspiring. The ground reality when you're in touch with the hospital is different. If a patient is coming on a three-wheeler, there's nobody at the reception tell him that, Baba, you cannot afford this hospital. I'm calling an ambulance and I'm redirecting you to a hospital which will be matching your pocket needs. They will still take him inside knowing that he cannot pay for it. And that's the starting point of the problem. The second problem that's come in is the CEOs who are running these organizations are not from medical background mostly. They are MBAs from commercial background whose sole motive is pleasing the shareholder. And slowly they convince the ethical doctors that money is the key thing. As an industrialist or as a doctor, you are doing something to achieve success. Money is a byproduct from that successful journey. None of us chase money for money's sake. But in this journey, what I find in the hospital case, we have got misled and we are chasing money. And that's where I think that's become a miss. So three things have happened in shortfall as bullet points. You've started the game of commissions. You started the game of uh, needless diagnostics and needless treatments which are not required to shore up your department's profit center because you are a, a party to that, you are answerable for that and accountable for that in certain hospitals. Not every hospital, but certain hospitals, yes. You are buying medical devices and pushing medical devices and products which have got the highest trade margin which will add to the bottom line because that's what's demanded by the hospital's organization. So, in doing that, the mindset has slowly started eroding on the core value system of the hospital. And when the patient is interacting, his family is interacting with the hospital, they tend to notice the change in the attitude. And that becomes their irritant. So when something goes wrong, that's where the trust deficit starts coming in. So I think if you have to rebuild the trust, you have to do the reversal or backtrack on these things which have happened. So unless we start backtracking on these three, four things which are creating that deficit, we will not be rebuilding it. And you're right, Dr. Saab. It is hardly 0.1% of the people who create militancy or terrorism, which creates a you know, bad name for the community. It's hardly point, point something, even the medical profession. I ask my sales people, how many doctors do you really feel are doing this? It's very, very rare. It's very, very rare. But again, it's not the doctor, it's basically the commercial hospital which is creating it. So that's something that we have to address. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I think, you know, my, my key takeaway from what you're saying is that, you know, to run an institution, profiting is important so that you can create feasible business models. But profiteering as a motive is something which is not correct. And second thing is that, you know, at the top level, in these institutions, you have to have people who go or have a lot of empathy rather than just a business model. Uh, Dr. Urvashi, let me come to you. I mean, you know, government plays a very important role in the success of, success of a healthcare system and a delivery mechanism. There have been a lot of schemes that India has had since independence when it related to healthcare. So I'm sure there are a lot of learnings that we've had on the way. What are some of the key learnings do we have that, we, that can become the fundamental basics for designing the new schemes that India needs? 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think, uh, you know, one of the major learnings is that uh, we've historically been a very cure-focused health system. Uh, whenever we've spoken about health, uh, we speak straight away about hospitals, we speak about medical doctors, specialists, and of course, you need all of that. But health is so much more than that. And health is so much more about well-being, about absence of disease, you know, as, as the WHO actually defines it. Uh, so there is need for a lot more focus on those preventive and wellness interventions. And of course, some of that now, hopefully we will see after the pandemic. But I think that's certainly been one of the biggest learnings from our health system that we need to reorient it, you know, towards health promotion, towards prevention, um, and not just talk about cure. Uh, and in doing so, we also need to look at our entire human resource base. So, of course, we need more doctors, we need more specialists, but there are many other cadres of health professionals as well, uh, which are called the sort of allied health professionals uh, or, or many others who practice community medicine or family medicine. There's so many other types of health professionals who we need to invest in. Uh, and we need to build up those cadres. If you look at some other countries, they have a cadre called nurse practitioners. Um, you know, when you first interface with the health system, it's not a doctor who straight away looks at you. Uh, it, it could be a nurse practitioner who actually looks at you. But in India, our reliance is, you know, solely on, on the medical doctors and the specialists. And as I said, we need more of them. There's no doubt. But that's not the entire health system. So I think that is one very big learning. Uh, that we need to have a public health approach uh, to the health system in which, of course, you know, secondary and tertiary care fits in, uh, but it's not the only thing. The other is that when we talk of India's health system, uh, you know, it's, it's a highly fragmented, heterogeneous, most of it are people in the informal sector, and that's actually also comes to the first question you asked, that, you know, why do we have these issues with trust, etc., um, because most of them are informal providers, they are small establishments, one to two bedded establishments, you know, so most of your healthcare sector is not organized or formal. Uh, so that is very important. How do we actually integrate all these small establishments, all these providers who are anyway providing healthcare to the population? How do you actually, you know, integrate them? How do you train them? Uh, because they are anyway present you know, in the, especially in the rural and remote areas. Uh, so, you know, whether you like it or not, they are there. Now, how best do you actually deal with that situation and that extreme heterogeneity in the health system? So I think that is another learning that we uh, sort of need to build on. Um, and I think lastly, I would say, you know, general awareness about health, because health is a sector with a lot of information asymmetry. Uh, so, making sure that all the stakeholders are actually uh, educated about it, uh, including patients, including, you know, doctors, families, all the different stakeholders, because some of it is malintent, but some of it is sheer lack of information and, you know, sheer lack of knowledge, just given the nature and the complex nature of the subject. So, I think a broader scale, you know, awareness uh, about health and the health sector uh, is also something that we need to really focus on from the government side. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Nani, just saying one second. Yeah, I want to just a couple of comments. Uh, first of all, what uh, Dr. Nath said. Uh, one thing I agree with him that uh, the hospital CEOs are, you know, MBAs and uh, young people, uh, they they can never understand the patient's problem. So if you are a uh, uh, hospital headed by a doctor, it does make a difference. Doctor, whosoever bad may be, he still has his sympathy for the patient. Ultimately, you know, we go and fight with these people, no, no, we have to make concession. So they, they, they don't bother about the patients. Uh, uh, what happens to him ultimately, they say in the evening, how much to balance. So that point is very well taken. So as far as possible, you know, this, this stand came from US. You know, all, everything we are learning bad, it has come from US. So they are also the CEOs are all the business people. They are in the and this and that. They make doctors around here and there. They are the, uh, the boss uh, rather than the doctor. So I think the healthcare system, private or government, 
it should be doctor driven thing that is important thing number one the deterioration started in india when the consumer doctors are brought under consumer uh, protection act so many of the investigation many of the procedures people do just to save their skin so which happened very wrong in india you know we were we were not that kind of people uh, that that we have to protect uh, ourselves now many uh, what is happening now is worse that in a small setup for example in a small town if the patient is serious the doctor is scared if this patient if i give some treatment if he dies they will either attack the doctor or they will they will break the glass of the uh, he is not willing to treat because he is scared of his life so there are multiple factors the deterioration has it. there was the article in times of india very last sunday uh, the condition of doctor and the healthcare professional the way the society is treating us is also dismal that i think the, the people the politician the, the public has also looked into that matter many times i believe me that many times everything is done right but patient dies they get ruckus only that they don't want to treat believe me this happens almost every other uh, you know week and lastly i want to tell you that the private hospitals are blamed for one thing that they give target to doctor believe me no hospital nobody can give target to the doctor it is the doctor own uh, you know kamzori uh, that he wants if he wants an like salary they have to do it so it is not it, nobody in my entire life has told me that how many patient come for your treatment nobody can tell me because if i curtail my greed they can tell me it is the greed of the doctor where the private sector or the ceo the blame but i think the fault is not with the not with the not with the ceo so i blame the doctor if they want more money so there is nothing wrong in earning money i always tell the doctor are the right you know you should treat, treat the patient properly then you should give the money that that's the point so it's a multi sectoral problem and take one thing also i want to tell <clears throat> coming to capability of doctors i have worked in uk i have worked in usa i have worked in middle east so i have a fairly good idea believe me everywhere the best doctors are indian doctors everywhere and not only that there is a published paper from massachusetts they followed 50000 patients from uh, harvard university they followed 50000 patients in that area over 10 years time and the result of the trial was that patient treated by foreign med- medical graduates out of these foreign medical 81% were indian they had more longevity of life so this is a documented paper and i want to tell the people of this country that your doctors are careful and please them don't don't don't, don't uh, you know have doubt on them so that has also needs to be considered so i think it's a double edged sword where the doctor is responsible for the best care as well as he is responsible for them uh, if i can use the use of the term malpractices so i mean that's a very bold statement uh, uh, dr ajit nag would be come to you uh we as a nation have come a long way when it comes to innovation and development leading we are becoming the uh, hub for medicine production medical equipment etc but one area that we lack in is the r&d so uh, one of the things that come into my mind when you're looking at the lack of r&d is probably because of the number of failures expected when you're developing stuff and the commercial viability of their investment that is being put in what do you have to say about that? very key point you raised and this was interestingly raised by me by john secretary dop today morning to me also r and d is done by a company at two stages either as a startup at the beginning for his first product line and is going to launch the his first product line or later on when he is already successful and he is going for incremental improvements or revolutionary improvements in the medical devices he wants to bring it to the field what you see as very impactful medical interventions whether from medicine or from devices usually come from the second one not from the first one because money is limited in the first one as a startup so it's mainly ideas not products 
and to do that you need money and you need time and you need gestation period now in india for medical devices we are 80% import dependent if imports keep on coming in at nil rate of duty or at 5% duty rate or 7.5% duty rate in most cases that's the case the indian manufacturers find it, it very difficult with a 15% production dependency factor to compete against those imports plus the payments come late the payments were coming late from the government hospitals now they also come late from the private hospitals excuse being uh, ayushman bharat payments coming late cghs payments coming late whatever but yes the distributors gets late and the manufacturer gets paid late when he is struggling to have his cash flows to pay his salaries and doing fire fighting for all this he virtually has got no luxury or a cash pile up for long gestation period r and d projects that's a reality so instead of going forward over the last 10 years i find in many cases we're going backwards there are very few success stories very few companies who i would say broken the barrier where they are in a strong position and then they would have the cash pile up available for doing this kind of r and d as a ongoing exercise that's the challenge point here uh dr urvashi uh, we have been talking about public private partnership and uh, that is the way to create a progress uh, in the field of healthcare now do you think that ttt model can really work in terms of bridging the gap between the need that need for healthcare that exists in the tier 2 tier 3 cities uh, and what is your take on it that do you think that it will really help but would it increase the cost because when you look at a private company getting into this business and uh, using consciously the word business because at the end of the day they need to be a feasible business model the cost of delivery will go up which is what is the balance between uh, you know getting the private players to enter into this to solve the problem versus uh trying to keep healthcare affordable and accessible yeah i think so there's certain services which i think it's the government's prerogative to provide and when it comes to public health i think the government you know has to take the onus for that and that's true anywhere across the world it's true here as well so public health preventive health and even primary healthcare to a great extent um it is the government which has to provide and so you know you have government mechanisms in place but we need to make them more effective you know we have the health and wellness centers being set up under ayushman bharat currently uh, again the thought process there is right that you know we will be looking at non communicable diseases we'll be doing screenings but we need to actually operationalize all that on the ground that is the challenge we have a human resource challenge we have a, a you know skill challenge so the government needs to address all that but there are certain sectors where the government has to play is the, the biggest role um but in other areas i think involving the private sector is is not a choice it's it's essential and it's an imperative because we have such a large private sector in health uh, that you cannot have the government just working you know in a silo on its own and you know leaving out this private sector like i said most of india's health sector is actually this this private health sector now whether it's informal whether it's you know not organized uh, but they exist and so as a government uh, you cannot really choose to ignore them uh, you have to find systematic ways of working with them uh, and i think there's different public private partnership models that need to be evolved um, when it comes to primary health care we are trying to see you know if if there are certain uh corporates to say corporate social responsibility who can uh, you know help operationalize these health and wellness centers or who can help set up telemedicine at these centers right so that's one model of public private partnership that could work the other of course is actually then setting up hospitals in tier 2 tier 3 uh, you know cities and towns as you mentioned and of course i think the costing there you know is challenging in many places um ayushman bharat can certainly help to drive up demand it has its challenges but uh, it can help to drive up demand and we're also looking at how ayushman bharat can be uh, potentially in the future expanded to a larger population base uh, because in india what we also have is a very large missing middle you know so you have the poor people but you also have a large middle 
uh, you know, population segment which doesn't have access to any health insurance. So they are not exactly poor, uh, but they don't have access to health insurance. So we are looking at how Ayushman Bharat could be expanded to serve that segment as well. Uh, so I think the demand, you know, exists in many, many places. But there has to be a partnership to figure out the feasibility and to make it work. And I think addressing the trust deficit between the public and the private sectors is the most important to make these partnerships work. Because I think there's still an inherent trust deficit um, and a lack of complete understanding of, you know, what is the real strength of the other stakeholder uh, and, and where should they be playing in the sector vis-a-vis -vis the other so I think that and building up that trust is the most important. But I think public-private partnership is the way forward in a country like ours and in a mixed health system like ours. I completely resonate with you because uh, you know uh, it's it's the challenges. Sometimes we just assume that the private sector is corrupt or they are profiteering from it. It's a big assumption that we make, and we are reacting and responding to that particular sector. So you want to say I disagree. I think people of this country today have more trust in treatment in private sector. I tell you why. Even the minister, they go to private hospitals. They don't go to common. That part is wrong. Anybody, anybody who can afford, he goes to private. Why? They trust trust the system. It is expensive, but the trust is more, more doubt would be. See, one of the things which uh, this country has lacked from day one that we never introduce accountability in our system. Whether it's the private sector, whether it's the government sector, there is no accountability. There are, I have seen many government hospitals, there are a lot of equipment lying on you, crores of things lying on you, so nobody has used it. Who, there should be somebody to ask them why this uh, 10 crore machine is lying this. It's not being used. So ultimately, I think, till we bring to accountability every, in our life, uh, in every sphere, that is where I think we fail in, in, in this country. Accountability will go ahead. Sir, my last question, I have seen this time is up, the uh, screen is there for a while now. Uh, but my one last question to you, sir, is since you represent a corporate hospital and you also are one of the most experienced doctors in the country uh, in the field of cardiology. What is your expectation from the government or the private sector that you think will help to not only create uh, accessible and affordable healthcare, but also help in better outcomes of healthcare demand? You know, that's a very, very good question. I I always say one thing that the government of any country should do two, three things only. They should look after the security of the country, defense should be with them, and the policy of the country should be with them. They, they should not do anything else. They should not be running airlines. It's not their job to run airlines. The airline running is your doing a business. Government should not do business. Government collects taxes from us. Like three areas, for example, the healthcare, education, they should spend money on, on this. They should not waste on other things. Now, when they when I say in healthcare, government should uh, encourage private sector to develop not only in big cities, but they should also give some kind of concession. If somebody wants to go to second tier two cities, small town, they should give some concession, then taxes and this and that, so that the private sector which is there, that's number one. Number two, government jobs to keep some kind of control on, on you know, pricing and the policy that how do we, it's, it's government job to check that whether we are doing right now. So they have to have some steps, but at the same time, they should produce a healthy company. You know, that one, like I tell you in India, the cost of wiper surgery practically has not gone up for the last 15 years. We say, why? Because the company is doing it. Somebody cannot afford fortress, if they go to somewhere, the, the fortress has to go to So it is, it is ultimately the, the healthy competition which is going to curtail all this. Yeah, I'd like just to add over here two things. Uh, what Dr. Clay mentioned over there very, very rightly. Uh, one is regulations. 
if people cannot follow a voluntary ethical code for themselves then i think we need to bring in regulatory controls dr clear mentioned audits that becomes a part of the old society so when you say regulations it needs to be the modern regulations which are audit based which should be decriminalized uh, not treat a businessman or a doctor as a criminal for any small offense but yes they seek progressive improvements and keep people on their toes the second area where the government can help is if the government has done a public private partnership for any scheme they should honor their terms in most cases we find the payments are not made they are months and months delayed by whether state government or central government in the beginning it's with a great fanfare a lot of cash is available in the beginning later on it just disappears and then they expect the private healthcare sector to fend for itself which it cannot if they want the private healthcare to come forward and share the burden and make it affordable ki ameer aadmi se hazar le loge middle class se 500 lagi garib aadmi se 100 rupees se kaam chalaoge then that 100 rupees has to be made available to him he cannot give it from his pocket or he can't take it from the 1000 rupee person and snatch it and give it to the 100 rupee person and that's the reality which i think the government is missing out on thank you so much i think you know uh, my key take away from this session is that you know while we have come a long way in uh, providing quality healthcare making it affordable uh, there is still a lot of things that need to be done and i think the public private partnership is the way to go but like sir said that you know there is a lot of account accountability that needs to be created and government needs to take over that role of monitoring and regulating to ensure that the mal practices can be reduced to a very large extent uh with that i'll come to an end of the session is there i think there yes sir uh thank you very much uh, dr clay you made a very low read statement that the politicians have trust in private sector uh, we'll have a different occasion we'll talk about it i don't want to get into argument at this point in time it's a very low read statement number 2 i also want to put my appreciation for medical audit i want to know from you dr clay as of today how many hospitals are undertaking medical audit that should be in public domain but sorry there are there are uh, doctor there are two kind of auditing one is the in, internal auditing another is external auditing i don't believe in internal auditing because if my hospital doing all you know my auditing they will not blame me if i do anything wrong so it has to be external auditing uh, in in us for example uh, the insurance company keep a tap on everything for example if a doctor uh, uh, and he does angiography but if his 30% angiography are normal they will come to him the average national figure should be 10% why you are uh, normal or 30% that means you are doing more so there are checks and balances and auditing the purpose of auditing is only to to bring uh, you know to the book the offender uh, they should be scared of this there some control should be there in india there is no control if if i say you need bypass surgery you need bypass there is nobody to question me so there should be somebody to question why why i am advising bypass surgery on medical purposes my third point is sir uh, doctors on an average don't have time to listen a study has been done where on on an average doctor spends 2 minutes uh, dr girish krishnamurthy in tata horizon i've written an article about doctors doctors should learn to listen 90% of your diagnosis is made based on history 5% by clinical examination 3% by routine test and 2% by the high end test my important communication and message in this i want to give in this forum that please take time to listen to what patient have to say that's number 3 number 4 urvishi madam before you go further i would yeah. like to say that this is the most relevant point most relevant point is that doctor must listen to the patient and i i i totally 130% agree with you i tell you that many times patient will come and tell me when they are talking to me sir your your time is limited so i want to be brief i said no my time is not limited you tell me whatever you want to tell me i agree with you doctor this is 
you know what has happened over the year that we have forgotten the basic of medicine. The basic of medicine is that most of the diagnosis you make by history. But I think that we have to go back to the medical school. Our curriculum to tell the medical colleges, they train the doctors, they should be taught in this way that they have to listen. I totally agree with you. Uh, Dr. Urashi, I want to add to your question about health. Now, there is a new concept of wellness. The traditional di uh, definition of health is a state of physical, mental, social, social being, and not only disease or affirmity. There are eight dimensions of health. Eight. Physical, mental, social, emotional, spiritual, environmental, and occupational economic. That we have to bring into the stage to look at the holistic dimension. of. I have also written an article on this as well. My final question is, there is a pandemic of second opinion. Pandemic of second What do you do about it? I think the uh, second opinion has started only because of lack of trust. And, and believe me, that in our country, it's a good idea. Whenever you are in doubt, take a second opinion. I, I, I don't uh, disagree with that. Why one has to take a second opinion? Because he doesn't have a trust or he is not convinced but but uh, line of treatment has been recommended to the person. So many times we see such a difference of opinion, difference of opinion between the specialists. So I think second opinion in an independent country should be allowed. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for the opportunity. Thank you. So thank you so much for asking these questions. And uh, thank you all of you for taking our time to be with us. I know you are all busy people. You're all busy people and uh, leaving OPD and hospital patients. I really appreciate your coming out all this way. Thank you so much, ma'am.